All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, the man next to me obviously doesn't need an introduction. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Chris Albrecht from STARS. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Thank you, Ben. You know, it's really embarrassing. I'm wearing exactly the same outfit that I was wearing in that photo. <laughs> and that was taken like six years ago. I won't say a word about that. Hey, um, let's, let's jump right in. You had, uh, you had quite a big week about a week ago, quite a big night about a week ago, when uh, at the Beverly Hilton, uh, the Golden Globe Awards. Oh, yeah. Uh, Stars won their first, their first Golden Globe Award, thanks to uh, Kelsey Grammer. It must have been uh, quite a night. And you know, it was, it was, it was very gratifying. Our, our, our partner, John Feldheimer from Lionsgate, is sitting there too, although I didn't see him in the awards. I think he was out buying companies. Um, skiing. skiing, there you go. I knew it was something important. That's commitment. But that, you know, it was, a, it, was, it, it was a great moment for Kelsey. It was a great moment for the show. Uh, we're proud of Boss, and I think you know, third party recognition, especially when it's uh, you know, coming in the form of a national broadcast network telecast, is nice for your brand. We're, we're you know, trying to build the star's brand, and to get that kind of recognition for a show is always a nice thing. And for you personally, uh, Kelsey gave you a shout out on stage. I think he said he was, uh, thank you for putting your ass on the line. Maybe I think it was a different part of my anatomy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it is fun to work in premium television, because you get to, I always used to think that the only rules that we had when I was working at HBO was that there was no rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, it, it's, it was fun to be able to order that show uh, without doing a pilot. It was fun to pick it up for a second season before it aired. Yeah. Um, and now it'll be fun to see what happens in the second season. So, uh, I, you know, it's a, it's a unique space that I get a chance to work in. So um, those are things that are yeah. the perks. So let's talk about STARS and what you are trying to do with it and what you are doing with it. Um, you said often that you need to quickly turn stars into a brand. And a brand is just a fancy word for a promise. That's all it is. So what is that promise that you're going to make to viewers, to affiliates, who are your two customers? To, uh, uh, sorry, viewers and affiliates. What's that promise you're going to make to them? Well, I, I, that's a good question. I'm going to have to think about it. No. Um, you know, I, 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 although you told me earlier never to read my press clippings, I was actually reading <laughs> an interview <laughs> that was printed in one of the papers here, where I talked about how many channels are out there doing how much original program, you know, doing a lot of original programming. And it's a pretty cluttered landscape with things that are interesting and, you know, whether it's non-scripted or whether it's scripted. And I think we are in a, we're, we're in a place where we have to have a fairly quick ramp up. So instead of trying to cover a lot of territory, what we're going to do is we're going to try and follow in uh, like a single two-step path which will be more theatrical, a little larger than life, um, things that are hopefully easily promoted, um, things that are easy to describe, you know, things that, that, that will be easy for the audience to get. Um, uh, not that they won't be complex shows, but things that, I, that hopefully will jump off the screen. Um, it's fun to be involved with things that are very dense and you know, roll out in a, in a, in a, a slow manner. But I think for us, we have, to, we, we have to go out there and grab an audience. We have a great slate of uh, first-run theatricals that are coming in our output deals with Sony and with Disney. And I think the, the original programming needs to complement that rather than try to augment it in ways that may make the brand a little more diffuse than not. OK. Is a, network just, is a network's brand just made up of its shows? Um, you know, I think a network is a channel. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to start to call it channels, okay. just, be, just because it's, it's like an easier thing in, in, in my head. But I think, um, you know, there's, there's three kind of components. There's what you are, and then there's how you're perceived by your distributors, and then it, it's how you're perceived by their customers. Mm -hmm. And probably a new opportunity, given the fact that there's a lot of talk about new distributors entering the space, is how you're perceived as an opportunity to those companies that, that, they, that may want to invest in coming into the, uh, the digital video distribution business. So um, we're, we are maybe perceived differently right now by those uh, different constituencies. And what I think we want to be is something that we have in, 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 in our heads, which is we have a valuable product, and then we want to be considered that by those other three constituencies, the current distributors, their customers, and new distributors. 
let's talk about how you make those shows. I, I think your budget, you say, in the year is a little over $100 million or something like that compared to what was, you know, six and change at HBO or whatever you're working with then. So it's a different world you're working in, undoubtedly. You said you don't use pilots. Uh, why, why, don't, why don't you use pilots? It's such a common thing in television. Yeah, and you know, and it's a really important thing. I mean, we were just working on something, and I thought, boy, I can see why, I, you know, why pilots are an important part of the process. I mean, I, you know, I think it's twofold. It's w one is that um, pilots are expensive, and if you're making a few of them and you don't put them on, you know, you're burning $20, 30000000 million. Uh, and the other reason, I think, is that being the new kid on the block in terms of original programming, we need to offer an opportunity that the other channels aren't. So for us to say, hey, you know what, bring your, your projects here, we'll develop them, we'll ask for a budget maybe, a, a, a production plan, but if the script and those other elements are in place, we're not going to ask you to go through another audition process in making a pilot, even though that's valuable for both sides, yeah. the channel and the uh, you know, production team. So uh, it was Ari Emanuel who, when we were about to pick up Boss, and I was trying to talk him into actually a pilot at the time because it was it was a little bit scary uh, to to go with a show with a showrunner who I didn't know. He said, "Hey, you're the new kid on the block. You got to step up." And and we did at that moment. And then I decided that actually should be our mo. So you said movies, which was a, obviously the D, in the DNA of the network you run now, uh, such a such a big part of it. But you want to get to 50 or 60 hours, I think you've said, of original programming a year, ideally. Yeah, ideally we'd like to have, you know, a new show premiering every week. I mean, I, you know, if there's a Friday night and that's our night. You, you know, in, in, uh, in premium television, although you premiere on one night and everyone focuses their, you know, when we focus our marketing and people focus their, their press and their reviews around that one night, it's really about how many people watch the show over the flight and how that show is impacting with your distributors. And, and so, um, but, you know, so if a Friday falls on a Christmas night, we probably will skip that night, mm -hmm. you know, but relatively speaking, we'd like to have an original programming presence year-round and have something to co-market our networks and our channels with our distributors um, and also something for, you know, for uh, people to write about. We want to be part of the content revolution. Did you see the NATBE mission statement? That they're part of the content revolution? which kind of scared me a little bit. I think everyone who was supposed to be in here is out storming the barricades of the content establishment in the revolution. But I wasn't really quite sure what that meant. Do you know what that means? No, but I'm sure. I'm you, sure someone here does. And there'll be a joke about Can this. Can you help me find them afterwards? There'll be a joke about this revolution being televised, I'm sure. <laughs> is, is, um, so if you want to get to 50 or 60 hours of, uh, there, but you've said before, and it's kind of obvious, that the, the whole idea of a movie library, a film library, is beginning to lose a little bit more value as there's more and more and more places that you can find movies now. So is there pressure on you to ramp up to get, I mean, is 50 or 60 hours enough if you're going to really try to build this thing? Um, I think so. I think that, uh, you know, given how many different offerings there are out there, it's more important than ever before to be unique than to create a lot of tonnage. Um, it's certainly an added benefit if you're a company that has a deep library that you can monetize. We're seeing companies, you know, CBS, CW, go and monetize their libraries in, uh, you know, with new distributors. Uh, and, and that's a great opportunity. It's not, it's not a realistic goal for us to create um, uh, a lot of original programming because there's no real way for us to monetize it. The dis the, the operators aren't going to pay us more money if we have more original programming. Um, and since we're selling our channels as a package, as a brand, and the, you know, the product isn't Spartacus or Magic City or Boss, the product is Stars. So for us, we need to have that great mix. And I think as libraries start to become a little more depleted with as, as much, you know, they're, they're being used a lot quick, more, more quickly than they're being replenished. So I think the first run theatricals, the, you know, a, 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 a good uh, critical mass of differentiated original programming can make the star's channels and the star's brand valuable across those, that uh, constituency base. But the shows can have legs internationally. I assume that's part of the reason you're down here. Yes. Well, I think for us, there's, there's two reasons uh, for the shows to have um, an international 
uh, appeal. One is that since we want to do things that are probably a little bit more theatrical and many of them will cost um, more money than the average show um, either on a basic tier channel or on a broadcast network channel, we're going to need to either fund that ourselves or find partners. The most likely are international partners. Um, and, and, and in order for that to be valuable to them, the shows have to have international appeal. Um, and then if we're, if we're fully funding the shows ourselves, the way for us to uh, net down that investment and you know, maybe even make money on it uh, is obviously to exploit those rights in other platforms, international being the one that you, you're really going to get the best return on. So um, I thought that those shows would be the kind of shows that might work best for our brand since they're not out there. But at the same time, necessity is the mother of invention, and it, it, it might have just been a convenient excuse. You, you guys are focusing on our dramas right now on the original side. Um, you've kind of said you're kind of getting out of the comedy business. Why? A lot of people making a lot of money out there right now. Yeah. Well, I think th that's one reason. You know, um, comedies are flourishing in a lot of places. The broadcast networks are doing really well with them. Uh, uh, Showtime has a couple of, you know, strong comedies on the air. Again, Lionsgate, you know, supplying probably one of their biggest hits. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this is hard. I mean, it's hard to make a theatrical film. I'm sure it's hard to make a great non-scripted show. I can tell you it's hard to make a great television series. And I think it's even harder when it's comedy because on top of doing all the things you need to do in a drama, you need to make people laugh. So um, we're looking at the opportunity to differentiate our network right now with these hour-long theatricalized dramas. And those tend to be the things that travel better around the world. Comedy is a little bit more colloquial, a little bit more provincial to uh, you know, its home territory. Um, and uh, you know, I think it's, it, it's, so it's not that we're getting out of it. It's just that we're, I think, going to wait and, and enter when we feel that it's the right opportunity for us. OK. The other thing, another big part of the premium television um, mix at, at some of your competitors in your former place of business is obviously sports. Mm -hmm. uh, either live sports or shoulder programming. It's a big part of what HBO does, a big part of what Showtime does. Um, is that a natural step for you guys at some point? Are you not there yet? Do you want that to be in the mix? You know, we certainly thought about it. When I was at HBO, I was a big proponent of trying to get the UFC to come. Uh, and why didn't I since I was the CEO? But, um, you know, the boxing establishment, I think, had a lot of fear about uh, the UFC. But so. When I got to Stars, I thought, well, maybe this is an opportunity to do something there. I'm not sure we had the right opportunity. I'm, I'm not sure we had, well, we could offer them what they were looking for, although we had discussions with them. Um, and in terms of boxing, there were some ideas. But I think if you look at what HBO and Showtime are doing, I know Epic's just announced uh, a boxing program or a boxing match or a series of boxing matches. Uh, I, you know, everyone's kind of stepped back a little bit because that world isn't as robust as it was before. You don't have the names. And so can you build the names? And it, it, maybe um, ESPN has dabbled in it. There's, 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 it it's, it's a fairly diffuse world. And I'm not sure that we could get into it in a way that would be distinctive enough. Um, and I, I think it's a bad idea for us to do anything unless we can really do it well. Okay. Although I did enjoy talking to you about boxing. Yeah, those were, that you was fun. You know a lot about it. That was fun. One of the seven people left in the country who do, unfortunately. What, um, we talked a little bit about this before, about m marketing for you guys and the challenges when you've got a, a limited footprint so far. Um, when, when you can't rely on on-air promos to really drive sampling or continued series or whatever, what do you guys do? Is it just, is it just you just have to spend a ton of money or? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, this is like one of, those, one of those thoughts that came to me as I was on my spin bike a few months ago, which was, wait a minute, we're in less than 20 million homes, which is more than, than we were when I got there. But so if, if, if I'm putting a poster up on a, on a bus shelter or even a tall wall on Sunset or Times Square, how many people that have stars are actually going to see it? I mean, right. if you just do the math. So I think in, in, in the years that we started original programming at HBO, we kind of reinvented how television is promoted. Um, and that was great then, because there were basically four networks doing original programming, and nobody was marketing it that way. Now you see a lot of money being spent by a lot of networks. I, I was talking to somebody who was in marketing at NBC, and they're, 
their marketing budget is like quadrupled since he'd been there and he'd been there I think like eight years or something. So a lot of people are having to market their shows in that off-channel uh, way and, and that just makes it even more cluttered to get your message through. So while I think we have to for reasons of brand identity, just the sort of Tiffany uh, um, uh, aspect that a premium channel has to have, we're going to have to spend money off-channel. But I think it really is uh, more important than ever before to find new ways to get the message to the people that already buy your service so that they'll see its value. And then through the attrition of that over time and the buzz that can come from a successful show, you know, people talking about things, the so-called water cooler thing, obviously third-party endorsements like the Golden Globes or press writing about things, then new people can become aware. Hopefully distributors become aware also. So marketing is a significant challenge given uh, um, you know, the number of homes we're in. I think when you see fully distributed basic tier channels that are in 90 or 100 million homes, you say to yourself, well, just you know, do the math. It's going to be a little bit easier for them to get their message, their marketing message, in front of someone who actually can click that button on their EPG. Right. And this week, in, in, uh, you, on the cover of one of our magazines, Multi Channel News, is a beautiful stars full color gorgeous ad and clearly I think that's the way that you should continue to spend your marketing money. Well we will money. always do that especially the week before you're interviewing me. Yeah absolutely. Good. Um, we should interview every week then. Um, hey Alan Ball in a story about you a while ago um, said something that was pretty interesting. He said all Hollywood execs are fear based. Are you? Do you operate from a place of fear? Uh, you know look I think we all have the normal fear when we get up in the morning of, will someone find out I don't really know what I'm doing? Everybody except John, that is. But um, John's, John, when he gets up in the morning, is if only everyone would listen to me. Um, you know, I, the one thing that, uh, I guess there, there are two things that I have realized uh, in my long career that seem to be consistent as I look at myself and as I look out at the landscape. Um, one is that the one thing that all of the projects I've been involved with have in common is that they're TV shows. Okay. And no one should take TV shows too seriously. So we get to do this, they're TV shows. The second thing is that these organizations we work for are companies, they're not families. And uh, unlike your family, at some point you won't be a part of it anymore. So those two realizations have made me a lot less fearful uh, about the consequences of actually leaving my house to make the decisions that I get to make during the day. I don't know that you're giving enough credit to TV shows and people like the Kardashians who do a lot for this country, but we'll just, you know. Um, I want to talk about the cable business a little bit because it's a, going through an incredible time, obviously. Um, sub fees are going crazy. ESPN's getting like 17 bucks a month or whatever. It's, I mean, it's really getting, uh, you know, it's getting crazy. Um, we all pay for literally hundreds of channels we don't watch. So just, first of all, from a macro perspective before we talk about you, what's your take on that? How long can this possibly last? You know, I think that when, when, when everyone talks about cord cutting and, or cord shaving, and I, I, I think it's one of those doomsday scenarios. You know, no one's really going to cut their cord. What they really mean is they may not buy the current video stack from their traditional mm -hmm. distributor. But truly, if you want sports and if you want, you know, all of those different choices, that's going to be the place that you're going to get it. The challenge will be how many people can continue to afford that because if you look at the, sort of the economic landscape, there's a group of people that can just write that check every week and there's a group of people that can write that check every week as long as both people in the family keep a job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's as, you know, depending on how the economy goes will depend on how many of those people maintain their ability to buy that stack. So, um, uh, but, but the, 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 the operators, they have that link into the house that provide a lot of services other than just that video stack. Right. And f people aren't going to cut that cord. So I think the, the, you know, the real challenge and the real opportunity for, for uh, brands, especially the premium channels, um, is can we be put in a, in, a, in, a, in a configuration where we can be even more valuable to helping maintain that 
upward in the house. So instead of looking at us as the cherry on top of the cake and the first thing that people shave, if you are um, a facilities-based distributor and you're worried about you know, new um, OVD distributors coming in, well, where they're really going to come in is in a library service or you know, movies, you know, in a, a Netflix-type configuration. And really, the, the opportunity for these uh, distributors to protect themselves against that are the, sh the stars and the Showtimes and, and the HBOs and, 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 and the Epics, who they're already in business with. What they have to find a way to do is to create a pathway to consumers who might not be able to afford the stack, switch out to something where they're, they're, they're able to keep their, you know, they, ha they have to keep their high speed because either it's important for their job or important for their school or, you know, whatever it is, and, 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 and become more inclusive in who can be part of, you know, their uh, product base. So you want me to be able to pay, not do the whole big cable package, pay 20 bucks a month for my broadband from Comcast or whoever, and then add you guys on top of that? Well, I think if, if you're really worried that people are going to switch out, are going to, you know, uh, are going to either take off their premium channels because they can't afford it, and that's the only thing they can take off, mm -hmm. or in a doomsday scenario, get rid of the whole video stack, well, why not try to keep them in your universe, let them, you know, choose the products that they want, and when they are in a position to upgrade again, you know, they can upgrade. But you're keeping that customer in your Right. business environment and um, you know it's not about how much one channel pays or or another I think it's just about can can we create you know in a, an economic landscape that's changing um, an opportunity for the you know for the customer the ultimate customer the you know the people that actually use our products to be able to access the ones that they want and I think that's an opportunity for everybody and really it's sort of the kind of the way it works when you go to any store. You're not forced to buy a lot of other things right. if you want to buy, you know, toothpaste. So, you know, it's, 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 it's great, love it, works for everybody, uh, if, if, if the entire world can afford it. But I think, you know, for us, we're valuable brands, we're valuable products, we're a hedge for a lot of our traditional distributors against new insurgents. And um, we would love to see them use us in, in, in ways that were a little bit more adaptive to what's really happening out there. Now, when you bring this up to them, do they they're, just... They're thrilled with this idea. Uh-huh. They yeah. give you the old, yeah, Chris, just keep making Spartacus. I'm sure this interview, thank God, there's about 15 people here because it'll get me a lot of phone calls later. Clearly. Is, um, you guys come off of Netflix at the end of, what, next month, I think it is. Um, happy with that move, feeling good with that? You know, it was the only move that we could make. Uh, uh, we are a premium service. We need to be packaged in a premium tier. Um, we went, had lengthy, lengthy discussions, have a great deal of respect for uh, Netflix as a company and, and, and uh, the people that run it. Uh, it th there was certainly, in our minds, a way to continue that deal. It would have meant Netflix thinking of themselves uh, and their, well, not of themselves, but thinking of the, of the products that they offer in a different way. Um, but ultimately, they have their, uh, you know, business plan and their business model. And we had ours, and we just couldn't find a way. So in the short term, there may have been a great announcement for stars. In the medium term, and certainly the long term, uh, it would have been a very bad move for us. Are people looking at Netflix, meaning programmers and content owners, are they looking at them in too much of a short-sighted nature? They're cashing the check so they can make their number this quarter and get their next contract, but is it going to hurt them in the long run? Are people, are people being too friendly with Netflix right now? I don't think people are being too friendly. I think, and, and again, it's not for me to speak about, about Netflix's business, but in talking to them, um, I think they see themselves as a deep library service both on the theatrical and the television side. Um, and I think that for the price that they're charging, that seems to be the appropriate product. Now they're adding originals. We'll see how that goes. But, um, uh, you know, I, it seems as if the, the, the way that the content maker or the content companies are now operating with Netflix, I think it's, I think it's working for both sides. Okay. Um, 
in January, you're, this January, today, around now, you're celebrating two years at the company already. Yes. Um, which is, that's like 20 years in any other job. Is, is, is there something you look back on that you're especially proud of that you've done here so far? Um, you know, I, I uh, when I became the CEO of HBO, I'd been there for, I don't know, 15 years, and I grew up with that team, and I knew the, the, the game plan, I'd helped write it, and uh, it was just kind of a natural, you know, one day I wasn't the CEO, the next day I was. Um, when I came into Stars, it was a very different situation. Um, I didn't know anybody here. The company's based in Denver. Um, I was coming in as the CEO, and uh, I looked at the Stars assets, Stars Media, the Overture, uh, you know, film company, and all the things that were going on. I thought, wow, this is going to be a lot of fun, and immediately realized that we needed to either sell or shut down Overture and, 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 and make. So, uh, and then the Netflix uh, situation, which from the outside seemed like an opportunity that were, you know, Stars had crossed over into new media. Um, that obviously became an all-hands-on-deck an, an all crisis. Um, so one of the things I feel really good about is that I'm sitting here two years later and those things are behind us. Um, we've got great relationships with our partners. We're, we have uh, very productive conversations going on with our long-term partners, uh, uh, with our long-term distributors. We have original programs that are coming out that I think are emblematic of the brand and, and we have a pipeline of new shows scripts that I'm excited and hope that we can find the money to fund. Um, I, I, I am very bullish on the fact that Stars is an emerging story, and I think if we can um, create the right scenarios for ourselves in terms of our product offering and in terms of being flexible in dealing with our traditional partners and new partners, which is not another way of saying we're going to take less money than they're paying us now, but, uh, but you know, become a way that, that we can be utilized uh, to become a more valuable product. Um, and, and what I feel good about is that I think STARS is in the best place to do that, um, that it's been in its history. So I, th I think that's kind of the job as a CEO. I think we have a lot more work to do with that. And that's become a fun part of the job, which I haven't had an opportunity to really sink my teeth into before, because like I said, my, my previous experience was just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the A-team and we're taking over the world. So, you know, when a journalist asks, lobs up a softball like that, you know, the next one's coming in your head, right? <laughs> so, if that's what you look back on and are happy with, what's, what's the one you look back on that you screwed up on, or what's the one you'd like to have back? Um, I think I would, uh, What's the one I would like to have back? You know, I, I get very frustrated when I find myself making mistakes that uh, I should know better. And if I, if, if I look at some of the decisions that we've made on the original programming side, I think it's been a surprise to me how challenging this has become. Sure. You know, it really is... While, while fun, it's very difficult. And s some of the things that I kick myself for are like not saying, you've been doing this for a long time, Chris. You should have seen that coming. Okay. Um, we talked about the, we opened talking about the Golden Globes and the great night you had. Um, I want to ask you before we go, um, you know, everybody knows about your departure from HBO and everything. Was, and now you've come back and done this, you know, you've got stars going in the direction where people are buzzing about your shows and you guys are launching, you know, the, the big thing last night and this morning about Magic City and, and there's a lot of buzz there. Was, is there a sense of personal redemption for you? You feel especially good about that, about how you've been able to do that? Um, you know, I am really grateful for all the opportunities that I've had. I'm particularly grateful for this one uh, because Greg Maffei and John Malone, you know, invited me to come run this channel. Uh, I'm also married now for four months, and so, so things that I never thought would happen to me or things that I never thought I'd get a chance to do again, I'm actually getting a chance to do, and they're all kind of happening around the same, the same time. Um, I, I have a unique experience in my life now, which is I don't want to leave to go to the office in the morning, and I can't wait to come home. I actually read an article in the New York Times yesterday where it was based on this French woman who's an executive yeah. in, 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 in Paris about, well, the, you know, the choices are 
you, if you want to, this is about traffic and children and everything, and if you, you, either, you either come in early and have to leave early or come in late and leave late. And I thought, she said, well, actually, if you come in late and leave early but work really hard while you're there, then you probably, and you know, now we're all, you know, we're sort of plugged in all the time. I mean, I start working, you know, at, se at seven o'clock in the morning when I start my workout, I, you know, to choose my, uh, my uh, piece of aerobics equipment depending on how many emails I have to return. But um, I think that uh, hopefully I'm a little wiser. And if I am, maybe I'll get a little smarter. And then, you know, maybe stars and I get lucky. Well, I think that beeping either means one of our pacemakers is going off or we're done. So thank you very much, Chris, <laughs> you, for ben. joining us today.